Come on up, you. All right, good morning. Thank you, Matai. Come on up. If the panel can join me on stage. Uh, I'm actually going to build off of where Matai left, which is this idea of how do we take those translatable... Uh, come on, let's go. And how do, actually, how do we accelerate those through development to get to patients faster? Uh, many of us, the, some of us this morning were at a breakfast event where we were talking through many of the different aspects of what is, what is preventing clinical development going at the speed that it needs to. And one of those areas is how we use all geographies, all parts of the world to accelerate it. So the focus of this conversation is, let's look at India. What role can India play to accelerate all of those um, development opportunities to bring medicines to patients faster, both in India, but also on a global basis? So I am joined here by a fabulous panel. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, coming from on the far left here, we have Uli, who heads up development for Boehringer Ingelheim. We have Sarah, who heads up development for Takeda. We have Peyton, who is the chief operating officer for PowerXL, and as of next month, will be the CEO of PowerXL. So congratulations. And he's not here today. But we'll be, yeah, sure. And he's not here today, but I want to thank uh, uh, Jamie McDonald, who has been a key supporter of this program and uh, the current CEO of PowerXL for, for some long period of time. Badri, who heads up development operations for Novartis, and Chris, who heads up development for GSK. So you have a broad range of experts, all of whom have worked extensively in India. Oh, and I'm Peter Ronco. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm the CEO of MS, which is a specialty CRO based out of DC. And today we're going to talk about how we run clinical research in, in, in India, what some of the barriers are, but also some of what the amazing opportunities are. So first of all, let's just start, let's just start with some kind of setting the stage and setting the ground. And I'm going to uh, ask uh, Bardri to kick this off, which is, it, it, give us a sense of where is, where, where, what's the state today? What's the, where are we today in 2024? Over the last year or two, where are you seeing, what, what's, what's the trend line looking like? And where are you most excited? The therapeutic area? Types of studies in India that are making the best advances. Thanks, Peter. Um, first person of the first panel in the morning, no pressure. So <laughs> let's stop there. Um, no, but maybe what I'll do is in, just in 30 seconds try to summarize the landscape in India. Um, first, I want to anchor on the fact that the healthcare, the, the whole healthcare sector in India is not a small sector. It's about a three quarter trillion dollar sector. So it's pretty big. Um, population in India, everybody knows about approaching 1.4 billion. Um, if you get down to clinical trials in particular, let me start with the therapeutic areas because this question came up in a panel, in a pre-panel session we had in, in the morning. What therapeutic areas can you go to for uh, to India? Um, we, I, I would want to say there is really not a filter. There's not a place where you say this is a therapeutic area I don't want to go to in India. That said though, the, you, you want to index in the population prevalence rare diseases, um, treatment-naive situations, um, more in the, if you look at the disease burden, whether it's cardiometabolic, if it's diabetes, whether it's uh, oncology, the rough rule of thumb, India carries about 20% of the disease burden. So to go for those indications is, makes complete sense. Now, if you go beyond that, um, we just finished, Novartis just finished, actually, not just finished, but finished a little while ago, um, an SMA, a gene therapy for uh, SMA. So, if, so now we're starting to see these complex modalities opening up in India as well. Probably not as straightforward as going for a cardiometabolic trial, but still is doable. And it's actually worth it because you get the patient population you need. Now, so let me start there. So that's, that's, the, that's if you look at it from a therapeutic landscape. If you look at it from a trials landscape, um, it's, it's a bit of a bimodal distribution in India. Before 2010, there was a peak in the number of trials, kind of peaked at 2010, and then tapered off because then it got harder and harder, regulations got harder, the environment, the ecosystem turned a little bit harder to do trials. Now what we're seeing, phase two, phase three trials, growing at a CAGR of about 15 to 18% in India. This is 2022 to 2023 data. Oh, sorry, 2017 to 2023 data. Um, so it's starting to move back at a healthy clip. It still hasn't reached the 2010 peak. It's only at about 60% of the 2010 peak. What's making this move? Um, the basic infrastructure, regulatory infrastructure to do clinical trials in India up till recently was based on a 1940s act called the Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940. So it's an 80 plus year old act. But 
um, given where we are, given what the, the landscape in, in the international community has happened, the regulators in India are starting to move and make changes to it. Since about 2013, there have been 10 um, modifications to that act to try to make clinical trials easier, more accelerated, uh, more accessible, etc. The most recent one is um, a new act of 2023 that is in the works. Um, that actually addresses very significant changes. Medical devices, for example, is now a separate vertical. Um, we will have much more transparency, a lot more acceleration in clinical trials, a lot more standardization, a lot more clarity in what ethics committees can do, their compensation, etc. So I won't belabor the point, but we are now starting to see these modernization things happening. Hospital chains and hospital networks are actually also clearly modernizing. 70% of the um, care that's happening, 70% of the patients, is in private hospital networks. Private hospital networks are now diversifying into tier two, tier three cities, into tertiary networks as well. And that gives you a broad base access to, uh, to patients. So this is all the things that are going on that makes India pretty attractive for clinical trials. So what's the rub? And I'll spend two seconds on it and stop. The rub is, it still is hard. Regulations are still not there yet. So it's still harder to do clinical trials in India. So before we get into some of the other the problems and the perceptions and the concerns, let's, let's kind of go with the, 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 the current state. So Sarah, do you want to talk about where you see the biggest areas of opportunity in India what, what, from a Takeda standpoint? I'd be very, very happy to do that. Good morning, everybody. When I hear bringing medicines to patients faster, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And I think that's where... India can really help us do that in, in a big way. So when I talk about Takeda, my view is influenced by some personal experience because I actually spent time as a resident working at Ames in Delhi in neuroscience and then also by experience um, in a previous uh, company where we did uh, spend some of our phase three clinical pivotal trials in, in India. Now at Takeda, we don't have that hands-on phase three uh, clinical trials experience at the minute. But you, Padre, painted such a beautiful picture of the evolution of the trial landscape um, and alluded to some of the major changes that are making clinical trials in India much more feasible, scalable, predictable, and so forth. And so we're taking this macro trend uh, into consideration as we're moving away from the question of should we be in India to when and how do we go to India? And we actually foresee um, a number of opportunities that we can start slowly with one to two uh, pivotal trials in the next um, year or so and then build that experience organically. And the things we're thinking about is um, we have a glo um, uh, local um, phase four experience in, in India, in IBD, for example. We've built a great network of uh, KOLs there and, and have a good sense of uh, what to expect. And so that would be a very organic place to start with a pivotal study. And similarly, um, the question of diversity keeps coming up, right? And so where, where might that benefit you? Um, in psoriasis, for example, looking at the different skin manifestations in uh, skin of different uh, uh, tones, skin tones, that could be another area where we might want to go and, and start running our trials. So it's very much uh, on point for us to go to India with uh, clinical trials. And as we gain positive experiences, I think that's going to build our muscle in that regard. Similar, I would say, to many other regions of the world mm -hmm. that maybe we have less experience in trials. In. Perfect. So we've laid the groundwork. There's the population there. There's the epidemiology specific to certain disease areas. There is the sophistication to run all types of clinical research within India. But many of us have participated in governance meetings internally where you bring that business case and then a therapeutic area or a senior leader is pushing back and so apart from bringing Badri to come and sell India to your internal teams, how have you approached that? Chris, I'll ask you first. How have, you, have you seen those types of, of concerns? How have you addressed them? And how would you separate out legitimate concerns from misperceptions? Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, and uh, just building on some of the comments, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to join the panel. I'll start from a GSK perspective. There's a huge unmet medical need. It's not no longer should there be, it's an imperative, India has to be. 
And part of that is driven by the fact that not only GSK, but many companies have built a huge infrastructure in India because of the talented population there to help build and run the operational component of what we do with our clinical trials. We have an obligation to then overcome what some of the misperceptions are. So the discussions that take place, one is it's slow. And there was a time when it was very burdensome. The timelines were very challenging. So even if you started off trying to include India up front, by the time they actually were able to come on board and enroll, most of the trial had already been enrolled. However, we have seen movement, and the timelines actually have decreased by about 30 to 40 percent. And so for a pure pharma play, actually, if you include India early strategically, you can get them on board and participate in that global trial, which brings the back-end benefit. You don't have to run a phase four study if you have a large enough subpopulation from India to contribute to your phase three data. That, that was probably the biggest challenge. Now, I will offer that vaccines is a slightly different issue, and vaccines is still slower. And that's because of the batch-by-batch batch release that's needed that adds to the timeline. So internally, there is this tension. If it's vaccines, you know it's going to take longer. And the fact is, given what you need to do to execute, um, making sure that you include India earlier in that discussion becomes critical. Um, the second thing is the infrastructure has improved. There are many good networks that you can tap into, um, and those networks actually provide high quality data, which is probably the second issue that always comes up, but what about the data quality? We not only have our own internal um, knowledge base to say that the quality is outstanding, but the external environment has also proven that with FDA inspections, EMA inspections, and a whole other bunch of inspections around data integrity and data quality from clinical trials always being at the highest level. And we have not had an experience where Indian data has actually hurt um, a review, slowed down a review, or raised questions about patient data, patient quality. Perfect. So speed and data quality, you're filing under the kind of the misperceptions and somewhat of a historical remnant. Uli, would you agree with those as misperceptions? Would you add additional ones? And what other legitimate concerns would you add? Thanks, Peter. I would absolutely concur with what Chris said. We have strengths, opportunities. Strength, opportunity for sure, the huge number of patients. Strength, quality, as a matter of fact. It's an absolute misperception that quality was poor. Infrastructure stepped up. We are currently at Beringer Ingelheim running a large phase three program global program where India participates in obesity and we see pleasantly fast approval timelines for the clinical trial application. Now what are some of the opportunities where we would love to see India possibly step up? From my point of view, clinical development is not just something in isolation, it is about bringing drugs to patients as a matter of fact. And here is an opportunity to carve out market access pathways to better understand what we could do, what India could do, what market access opportunities and pathways we could jointly identify. And of course, the topic of IP. I think uh, is a huge opportunity for India to step up here. And then we have an end-to-end -end holistic approach, clinical development, and commercialization, and this is what, from our point of view, would really cut the cake. Perfect. So, um, speed and quality generally we're seeing as misperceptions and kind of historical. Um, ongoing discussions around market access, I think, are legitimate concerns and ones that need to be addressed in governance. And the, just to make the IP is another one that you believe, again, on an asset by asset basis, is a legitimate conversation that governance should be talking through. Is that the right? Perfect. Absolutely. Thanks. What else? This is where the audience participation time comes in. What are we missing? What either misperception? You, know, you guys have sat in governance meetings. You've jump, stand up, and just give it. Shout out some of the, the things that you've heard. No, I just want to have a question, maybe for Uli. So I'm sorry about the data. You talked about the misperception. When DI or even the market, when you went to, to India, did you take a leap of faith, or did you actually look at data? How did you think about the approach to increase the presence? How would you articulate? that early 
Yeah, thanks. Um, I think we were some, one of the many companies that had a footprint in India, decided to step out a couple of years ago. Right now are still on the fence and observe. Um, um, however, decided to go back to India in these seas areas where we have an established network. And that would be at least our, my recommendation, where are you strong, where do you have a network, where you can also leverage uh, the network of CRO partners, we have Peyton here, and then you most likely will be set for success running clinical trials in India. Um, uh, the performance that we are seeing is very good, but again, it does not end at the ClinDev approval step, it goes beyond. We have a point over here. One a logarithmic difference between <laughs> clinical trials between clinical trials that are done in China versus India population aside etc cetera, etc cetera. we all would rather go to China why um, I, I'll, I'll start and I have others that I'm sure can comment um, one, there's been much more regulatory consistency, as ironic as that sounds, mm -hmm. um, with China every once in a while throwing a curveball. There's been this steady progression. Number two, there's been a concerted effort on the part of the authority there to really engage in the right dialogue around study design, programs, and really pushing sponsors to say China should be part of your program first. That same dialogue does not occur with the Indian Authority. In fact, it's still very much hands-off, which makes it much more challenging. And so what you see is an embrace of both an academic, regulatory, and sponsor partnership to really drive clinical research. The hospitals have high quality in both countries. There are well-trained individuals in both countries. But the difference is the environment and the receptivity, I think, that the government has to working with the sponsors to make sure that there's not only the clinical research, but the access on the back end. Yeah. Okay, so let's, we've heard from Big Pharma. Peyton, I'm going to turn to you and kind of ask the same questions, essentially. I know you work with both Big Pharma and Biotech, but give me the Biotech perspective. What are you hearing in terms of both the challenges as well as the opportunities? Yeah, it's such a good question, and I would say I can affirm a lot of the data that has been shared. Obviously, we get to see a landscape of clinical research across the large pharma um, as well as biotech, and I must say I pulled the data fresh because I think my own bias was that we were mostly it's in studies across all phases of research for our larger customers, but I was surprised to find one-third of those studies actually were biotech, and that's small and mid, including some emerging biotech. That did surprise me, you know, you're of your own bias in terms of lens, so I was excited to see that. I will tell you when I looked a little more closely, some of those are biotech companies that have had experience in their prior careers at larger pharma companies, so they've had success in India. Um, but I would say Badri is spot on. We are seeing significant growth and opportunity um, in terms of the number of tri global trials with more sites in India. Um, but I think the key point is, is starting in India early. Um, that is the critical point that we're seeing, but I think it, this is the opportunity. I do think we're at about a 20% growth right now, so that's a huge opportunity, but we are dramatically underserved. So these are big percentages on minuscule numbers in terms of the study landscape we have, vastly underrepresented. So that's why I think I'm excited about this forum, because how can we put the issues um, out there to be able to support this environment? And last comment, I do think, Badra, you, you made a really important point about the regulatory environment. We need that predictability um, to be there, and I think that there's certainly now some growing support to have more predictability, certainly more openness, like we see in China, ironically, would be you know, very helpful you know, here. So this kind of dialogue, I think, could be the beginning of doing that. But yes, biotech is in India, and it's across all therapeutic areas as well. So I didn't see one area that stood out um, in particular on biotech or large pharma. It was actually quite diverse. Yeah, a couple of comments, because again, my company, we're a CRO, we're, we're partnering with many biotechs globally, and also with a number of institutions in India that are seeing increasing investment of running India for India studies, which I think, again, is a continued opportunity. Biotechs, let's, let, let's not just think about biotechs within five miles of here. Chinese biotechs are heavily investing in India and using that as part of their broader development programs. That's a key aspect of how they're growing. 
The other part I would say is uh, when, I, when, I, when I talk to a number of biotech leaders, there's still a huge level of ignorance. And I say that not in a, in a mean way, but they are so fixated on how am I getting approval in one, my, my primary market? And that is obviously that it's, it's getting the data or they're going to be in, 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 not going to be able to survive. So as opposed to many of the big pharma companies that typically have an India team, you have people on the ground there that you have worked with for many years, you have a level of understanding of the market and how it has changed over the past 10 years. There's a huge education component within the biotech sector to talk about how things have evolved. Because some people are still going back to 2013 and 2010 and, and what some of those issues were. So let's, let's talk, I want to talk a little bit about how we can actually help with that progression. So um, one of the, the ironies is that over the past 10 years, Bardry talked very nicely about peak of growth, reduction in growth, and then growth again. And, but throughout all that time, many of the big pharma companies were heavily investing in resources in India, biostats, data management, programming. How can we use that investment to really help accelerate the trial activity in India? Uli. Peter, you almost stole my thunder um, <clears throat> because this is exactly what it is. The infrastructure is there. Data management, pharmacovigilance, many of the back office functions are there. And that's why quality is not of concern. We've heard it uh, from all the panelists. And I think this is the strength that we can and should build on. And at the same time, we need to have the dialogue. We need to have the dialogue, and I don't want to sound like a broken record, but at least for us, it's super important to have this end-to-end -end point of view. We need to understand what's the market access pathway, what's the IP strategy, and then we have great opportunities to leverage the back office people, the strength of India. Badri, similar question. How has Novartis thought about this? How would you see this as a springboard? Yeah, maybe, maybe two, three points just to add to what Uli de, uh, said and what you said. I, the, the companies like mine, we've, we've invested in India for about 18 years now. So it's a long-term investment, and we see this as a long-term investment. Maybe two, three specific points, right? As we start to see the diversity of indications and modalities over there that, that, are, that are taking hold, um, can we actually fuel and catalyze more networks around certain concepts like rare diseases, orphan indications, et cetera, that brings together hospitals, um, uh, advocacy, advocacy uh, um, uh, entities, various institutions together. We, companies like mine or Uli's, et cetera, have the wherewithal, the on in the ground presence to do that. Can we use that to actually catalyze that? Um, the question was asked about China. In China, one of the things that accelerated, I think, one of the regulatory um, modernization was the public-private partnership. And that public-private partnership actually leveraged uh, bringing um, uh, a lot of intelligence from other parts of the world into China to essentially um, speed up, accelerate the process of, of modernization. Can we do that over here? Um, that's the second thing. So I'll just leave it there. There's a couple of things we can do to actually catalyze. Peter, I had two questions, just, just following up on that. So one was, you know, when we talk about doing trials in India, and Peyton, maybe this is a question for you, the, the piece around the speed comes up a lot. So when you looked at your data, do you see a logarithmic or somewhat of significant difference in rate of recruitment, and if so, why? Mm -hmm. And then the second question I had was, we touched a little bit on it, is IP. And I know it's case by case, but that's that's a, not just IP uh, on the asset, but also as you think about it more end to end, Uli, as we were saying, even on data science, AI, any of that, there's a, a lot of concerns around IP, although the talent is there. So we'd love to address both. Yep, I'll start. You probably can follow, but um, we definitely are actually seeing speed. You know, you have to be intentional, you have to start early, um, but we're all spaces. I looked, we looked at the feasibility as well as ongoing studies, and the progress is there, which is exciting to be able to see. I do think we have to continue that dialogue and that pressure to make sure that we continue to see that improvement or we won't see the growth um, continue. So I think it, there are encouraging signals um, right now and I think the success will obviously allow us to br bring more transparent data which will help. I can tell you that you know, across the clinical research organizations we're also sharing more of our data through our industry association to be able to bring that data to sponsors to bring more confidence. I think that's going to be particularly important to biotech companies as well that don't have access to the yep. data that these large big pharma 
partners do. So that's probably the next step because that will give more clarity on what we're all seeing in terms of timeline. But you have to start early. Um, you can't add in India later. And I think that's, you know, that hesitation is probably the bigger challenge. But IP is a big question and market access. I think Uli has brought up some really cr critical questions on that side. But maybe one comment on speed, just to put this into perspective, since the question about China came up. In our phase three programs, uh, we include China as part of our pivotal studies. And when you look at when do we have FDA approval versus um, approval by the Chinese authority, it's literally back to back. There is no time difference anymore. That, um, 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 for a couple of reasons, would be a bit more challenging uh, in uh, India because you have to have the import license, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's why um, um, timelines would be faster. And I think coming back to what Chris said, um, the commitment of the Chinese government to push the clinical trial landscape forward was just a different one. And the same is true to some extent, at least on the IP side, uh, because there is openness to discuss. Now, where this results and how this looks like is a slightly different story. Um, but um, at least from my point of view, India is still here at the very beginning um, of such discussions. Maybe two points. Um, one is this issue around data and IP is not unique to India. Correct. It's a global issue. We face it whether we're in China whether we're talking to Europe and individual countries, the flow of data is going to actually become the key issue, I believe, that will limit our ability to move rapidly because we're gonna be facing a variety of local environments that we now need to pull together if we wanna run global trials. The, the other point I wanted to make is one of the things I believe personally that unlocked China was that the authority was working very closely with FDA, and FDA actually had people go over, had academics go over to train them on statistical methods, give them insight into how FDA was working, but also how academia worked. I'm very hopeful, given the relationship now that's burgeoning between FDA and the regulatory authority in India, that some of that will also help open and push not only consistency, but a mindset that you see that China developed and now is operating in, move into India, which would make it easier, because there are still major challenges in India, despite all the progress that has been made. So let's, let's, let's kind of build on that. So uh, broader question, we'll start with you, Sarah, but then go across the entire panel, I think, which is we have a variety of stakeholders here, government, academia, and for, so forth. What else would we, what, what, what messages would you want to give to them? What can they do to help in India continue to build up? We heard some examples here. What else would you want them to, to do? Yeah, and you're right, so many examples have already come up, right? It's predictability of the timeline. So we heard about some fast processes. Are they always fast? Are they reliably fast? Or what, did you get lucky, right? So there's a predictability that really helps us manage our clinical <coughs> studies. Um, similarly, the quality, it's, it's great to hear that consistently the quality is, is good, but you can't let that slip, right? So uh, that's another big one. And then it's um, infrastructure build. So um, you, I think, Badri mentioned the importance of networks, and we're beginning to see that, I think, with Apollo Group, for example, forming trial networks. It's a capacity build also of the physicians and the PIs in terms of their training. It's an ability to find the right patients for the right uh, indications, right? So th there's so many things there. And then um, I really liked what you said about the uh, FD, uh, you know, the international standards, shall we say, and the um, closeness of process between China and FDA. I mean, it really makes it so much easier for those of us on the ground designing the trials if we don't have to put in too many local elements and have uh, differences across regions in terms of uh, the study protocols and so, so forth. And similarly for access, if not every region and every country had their own requirements, um, it would get medicines to patients faster. So some standardization of, of process would be really helpful. And I'm sure there are many, many other thoughts. Peyton? Yeah, standardization, absolutely. I think that's a key one. I am excited that we have you know, Dr. Califf on our, our, you know, on our program today joining us because I think teeing up some of those questions, we know that he's been really just recently in India, being able to have him be a voice um, and really play that role could help address some of those inconsistencies that we see and, and the concerns, right, that are slowing down progress in India. And I certainly love the thoughts of us harnessing the power of our talent. 
You know, for, for us, we have 24,000 em employees involved in clinical trials. One fourth of them are in India. It's an incredible talent base. And so if we can leverage that infrastructure to really accelerate clinical research in India, it could be transformational. And it's a very experienced talent base. Because again, if you think about the journey, there was some, it was starting out with things like payment processing. But at this point, there are, there are client facing senior roles with people who've been there 10, 15, 20 years. That experience can absolutely broaden out into the clinical sites and into the broader infrastructure. And the other piece that I welcome others' thoughts is uh, my company, and as I'm sure many are, are also investing in a large amount of data science activities within India. That's an area where there's truly world-leading um, talent, but also the opportunity, both to help the global structures, but actually also to see whether India can accelerate with the use of data science and AI to how they're running clinical research, and whether they'll actually be able to use that as an accelerant to kind of to go further than they, that, that we've seen in the last couple of years. Does that make sense? Badu, you. Yeah, Peter, I was going to go back to your earlier question, and then address this. So I want to make two points. One, two, two points for the government. It's not just about creating policy, it's about enforcing policy. So let's make sure there's an enforcement mechanism that keeps pace with the creation. Second, I think the government would be really well suited to partner with, the, with private institutions to so have a really robust private-public partnership. And then the point for the pharma or biopharma industry, don't go to India as rescue, go to India as plan. Second, don't go to India for your first randomized patient, go to India for cutting short time off for area under the curve. That's where you get benefits from India. And maybe just some things that you do have to be careful of because at the end of the day, this gets down to working with institutions. And we can have the best policies, we can have the regulators on board, but if the institutions are not also moving in that direction, it becomes challenging. And the government will push you to work with both private and public um, sectors. The problem is the public sector is much slower than the private sector. You can get things done and that's where the timeline decreases have occurred. They have not occurred in the public institutions. There is a sequential IRB approval process which requires approval by the government first for the clinical trial. The second thing is it takes a long time to negotiate budgets at those institutions. So if you're not thinking about that and doing that early, you're not going to have the public institutions on board, which will pose a challenge as you try to move forward with the entire trial design and implementing the clinical trial in India. Back to you guys. So we have about 10 minutes left on this panel. What have we said that you disagreed with? What additional questions? We have a lot of it. I wanted to share some personal experience recent about trial in India. So we are about to launch uh, actually a, a, a first in human study in India uh, for uh, a product that's uh, very differentiated, discovered in our R&D labs in Bangalore, and now we have IND approval here by FDA. So while we're thinking of doing that trial in other geographies, we are going to launch that in India. Uh, the three. Um, buckets where I just want to share uh, my recent experience. The science side is absolutely covered, big time. I mean, I've personally met all the top oncology institutes. These investigators, experts, KOLs, they are very familiar with what's out there, what's going on, and the quality and the infrastructure that is being built. You have to do some legwork in terms of selecting the right institutes and right folks, so there's a lot of relationship building that's required. Science side is pretty much covered, I think. And I've had the privilege of being involved in clinical trials at many in major large pharma and biotechs here in the US for the last 30 years, so I can appreciate that. Patient population, you know, we're <coughs> going to be going after lung cancer with very specific uh, subsets of, of underlying mutations. And that, of course, in many geographies, you can find an SCLC patients with, uh, with the specific mutations. But we're, we're going after high-grade glioma, which is a very you know, specific brain tumor population. And some of the projections I saw in the US about accrual, that was like, my god, this will take another 10 years to do the study. In India, it was very surprising to see how many of those patients are going to be available, and especially 
the way to select those patients, the biomarker, in this case, we're going after IDH mutated patients, you know, all the assays and, and uh, facilities are available at major centers, and some other rare tools. The third piece is where I think we are still dealing with, even though we have, you know, connections with India, the drug was discovered in India, it's being developed in, here in the US and Australia. The scientific review committee of the regulatory is, is rock solid. I mean, it, it was very quick, they evaluated, they recommended, okay, we are going to approve this, go forward. And that's when the bureaucracy kicks in. And now with all the recent improvements in regulations that the panel has described, I think it's really now, as Badri pointed out, enforcement of those regulations. Educating the, the regulatory agency, the reviewers. And, and that's where I think we are now spending a lot of time. It's a little bit of an uncharted territory in India right now when it comes to first in human, but some trials are already started. Of course, phase three trials are going on. But is that education to the regulatory division that uh, should be proactively planned and it needs to be done in relationship, in collaboration with major KOLs in India who can uh, influence. Um, because sometimes the queries we're getting is, is regulatory agency is getting confused as if it is a phase three or phase four trial. So they're asking, you know, 200 questions. That's totally, you know, at least in my opinion, humble opinion, it's irrelevant. So that education is critical. Great, thank you. Well, we have about five minutes left, so I'm actually going to ask along the panel to actually summarize and say, get, answer the question around the, what was that one thing? Yeah. And then also, what would you look, look to see a year from now, two years from now? How would you hope that we have moved forward? What are you looking for in terms of that uh, kind of the, the landscape? So I'll start with you early, and we'll go right down the line as our final comments. All right. So the one thing that I wish is commitment and predictability, because I think that's what matters if you want to commit to driving business there. And um, in a year from now, um, for one, we learn from our own experience because we are running clinical trials in India. And for two, we would love to see whether government um, uh, would be open in engaging in dialogue with us regarding IP market access. All right, I'm going to be like you, Uli. I'm a broken record. It's predictability uh, in the timelines and the engagement. And then a year from now, I hope that we will have been in regular dialogue about how we can get our pivotal studies going in India. That's a great one. I'll, I'll build on that and I'll say thank you, first of all, for being here, but accessibility to regulators, I think, especially across, not just the largest pharma, but across um, the ecosystem, I think would be big in a year from now. Um, I'll be very practical. I'd like us to look at our number of patients, studies, and sites participating and see more than a 20% increase. I think that would be a, an appropriate measure um, and hopefully further engagement with sites and patient advocacy groups as part of that as well. Let me push you a little bit further on that. When you look at the growth, would you be looking at in certain phases or certain types of studies that would indicate a more robust growth within India? Yeah, uh, we're focused more on the 2-3 growth. That's really where we see it and that's, that's where I would be looking at the KPIs. Which I think is a huge change as well from maybe five, ten years ago, where there was still a lot of phase four medical affairs investment in India, right. but that's not that's India investment for India. That's not as what we're talking about. Being part, right. Exactly. <laughs> that that shows true growth and true long term commitment. Exactly. Madri. Uh, so one one statement: um, we didn't go to India as a leap of faith. We actually went to India in a very planned, methodical way because the data shows that we should be in India. So that's um, what what do we want? Um, we want enforcement, like I said, enforcement to keep up with the policy. Otherwise, the policy, uh, we don't really see the gains from the policy. So enforcement. Second, I think gentleman brought up training. Um, we don't see the training on the ground keep up um, with the policy as well. And then the policy gets diluted. So those are the two asks. Where we would be, Peyton, you said it. So we want to continue to grow our presence. India is really important, so we will continue to make India even more important in our clinical trials in a planned and methodical way. And I would offer, in addition to what was offered, reiterate upfront, knowing what the intellectual property and data requirements will be that will be consistently 
held over the long term and being transparent about that right now. And if I look forward to a year from now, the ability to have actually sponsors sit down with key colleagues in the regulatory authorities to discuss projects the way we do with other health authorities. Fantastic. So I hope that this has laid the groundwork for the rest of today because I think there's a gentleman over here talked about there is a wonderful bedrock of scientific knowledge and expertise here. There is a wonderful bedrock of high quality research institutions that can be part of how India can be part of global programs. But what you're also hearing is from a very experienced group of individuals who have worked with India for 10, 15, 20 years, just like any other country, there are issues, there are concerns that we need to work through to make sure that it can be done in the right ethical and economic way. And you heard predictability, you heard broader commercial planning, you heard IP. Those are cons you will hear those in many other countries and many other markets. And I hope what today will bring to you is to separate out the kind of the mythology from the genuine areas that we need to work through as a broader life sciences industry. If we, if we can help educate three, 400 people here today around what truly has changed over the last five, 10 years and move people forward to what the current areas of focus are and the current way we can work with regulators, I think we as a group will have done a huge service to the life sciences industry, okay? Because if we're operating with the current issues rather than the historical issues, we can actually work together to manage those. So I wanna thank the panel. I really do appreciate your thoughtful comments. If we said something that offended you or you disagreed with, Grab us in the hallway. Grab us in the networking break. That's the whole point of these events today. But I want to thank everyone for this. And with that, I'll hand back to Matai. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.